Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for making your way out here on such a beautiful day. So quick announcements. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of our sponsors. Thank you, as always, to uh, NumFocus for sponsoring this meetup, uh, as well as for, uh, to TD Ameritrade, my employer, for sponsoring this space. Uh, also, Midas for sponsoring the delicious food that we have here every month. And also to, to our friends, our user group in Ann Arbor for uh, co-hosting this one. A couple of important points. Uh, for those who are new or maybe just forgot, emergency exits, there's one right here. And then there's another one that's right outside the doors to your right. So don't take the elevators in case of any type of emergency. Use the stairs. Uh, always, we're looking for feedback, both positive, uh, critical, negative, you name it. We'd love to hear more about uh, how we're doing uh, as well. You can always uh, look for some of the uh, slides on our uh, GitHub page as well. Remember that we're in a borrowed space, so please do pick, out, uh, pick up after yourselves. The garbage cans are where the, right under where the food is. Okay, so grab your cups afterwards. Uh, rules of conduct for Q&A. Unless it's a quick question, please hold it until the end. Uh, please re uh, phrase your question in the form of a question and try to keep questions to 30 seconds or less uh, and avoid long statements or monologues right, about how you're doing this for your research, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, there will be time for an open discussion at the end of, sort of the, the Q&A uh, section where you can come up and talk to the speaker or even in, uh, intermingle as well. I'd like to read our code of conduct. Uh, Pi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, religion, or experience. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds and levels of experience. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others, do not insult or put down other attendees, behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. But overall, thank you for making this a welcoming and friendly environment for everybody. So we'd like to start off with a quick icebreaker. So I'm gonna ask that you turn to either somebody on your left or to your right or maybe in front of you or behind you, preferably someone that you haven't met before. Uh, introduce yourselves and tell them something that is not a non-technical thing that you can just talk about for 30 minutes and present about that thing. For instance, talking about how Game of Thrones for the past few seasons are good or not, <laughs> right? Or whatever you, it may be, or no spoiler alerts, I hear people look, you know, covering their ears, right? But you just tell them what you could talk about. Again, something that's non-technical, all right? So go ahead. I'm gonna because I've met yeah. you already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Oh. I'm Deepna. Deepna? Yeah. I'm Caitlin. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So, I think Maybe like architecture? I think so. I don't know. Yeah. Like, what kind of stuff? Uh, okay. Okay. That's awesome. Um, I could talk about taco places in Austin <laughs> and recommendation and pros and cons of different types of tacos. Um, he stole it. He stole this from me, so I've already used my answer. I'm trying to think of a good one. Um, what else? I don't know. Poetry. Talk about Game of Thrones. Poetry. That's the other thing I could talk about for a long time. Yeah. I do. Yeah, a little bit. Not a lot. It's also what? I love. You do? What kind of stuff? Yeah. What do you like? You said poetry, right? Like, yeah. Uh, it's been like in my language, I'm from different, uh, I, I don't speak Gujarati, so okay. sometimes I read in, uh, I read in uh, like my language poetry. So okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. It's awesome. So what kind of poetry? Um, so I 
I follow a couple of like modern poets, like poets that are still writing today. Um, and I like really simple, fun poetry. Like, um, I, my favorite author kind of reads like children's stories, almost. Like children's stories, almost. Kind of, yeah, fun and different. So, like porches with like kind of porches. Yeah. yeah. That was great. I heard a lot of buzz. <laughs> so hopefully you will uh, at least leave here at, uh, having met somebody else that has similar interests. Uh, I'd like to talk about this one in data science. Uh, there is a new uh, Python library that just came out called Stumpy or Stumpy uh, that, is, uh, that can be used for a wide variety of data mine, uh, time series data mining tasks. I happen to know the person who created it, but I'd love for you to <laughs> contribute, use it, uh, provide feedback because that person was me. <laughs> uh, and it was open source thanks to my employee TD Ameritrade, so you can either check it out at, at, on, our, on our GitHub page at TD Ameritrade uh, slash Stumpy, or you can just do a pip install Stumpy as well. Also, quick plug for our uh, event next month, Alexandra Johnson uh, from SIGOPT is coming to talk to us about machine learning infrastructure, and that's back on Wednesday, June 12th at 6 p.m. So sign up for it, spots are filling up quickly. Just to survey the community here, if there's any community announcements, anybody want to, looking for a job, have job openings, or, or just have a pet project that they want a little bit of help on, feel free to raise your hand. Keith? Uh, I think I'm looking for work still full time. Um, if you have any questions, come find me after the talk. What kind of work are you looking for? Uh, software development, system administration, or network engineering. Anybody? Claire? Hi, I'm Claire. Um, I work for Trace. We do um, a video for youth sports. We're currently hiring for our data science team, so if you're interested, come find me afterwards and I'll have more information. And Claire was one of our speakers for January, so her video is posted on YouTube as well. So look up Pi Data Ann Arbor, uh, look for Claire's name, and you'll at least get a, even a, a broader uh, idea of what uh, her company does. Uh, other, other people? Uh, in the back, Omid? and I work on uh, different financial data uh, station and non station And I work with uh, time series analyze, but it wasn't this much like nice analyzers just simply taking out season how many and cash flows in the I'm working on automation data analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Prasanna and uh, I work right below downstairs at Lamasoft. Uh, we are looking for a senior data scientist for the uh, machine learning team uh, within our company. So if you have anything, please uh, reach out to one of the three of us. Like Can you put your hand up here. so that people know who to look for? Yep. Craig, yes. and then Sushant. So. Is there somebody on the side? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Manish. Um, I'm an undergrad studying uh, computer science engineering. So I'm currently looking for an internship, software developer uh, position, uh, potentially. Uh, this summer, uh, or any project that you have, um, I can work on. I mean, anyone, I would love to help out. So, and I've done three internships before as well. Um, just like showing my interest. Thank you. Great. Uh, Jane. Um, yeah. So um, I'm Jingyu. I'm the managing director at uh, Michigan Institute for Data Science. So we pay for the food. Um, <laughs> Thank, you. So, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Peter Smith, probably the oldest guy in the room here, but uh, I just finished a Python course. I love it. Uh, looking for something to do, uh, look, a job would be cool. Uh, I've started five companies in my life, software companies. The biggest went from basement to 150 men company. Uh, it was a 3D CAD company. Um, done a bunch of stuff. Uh, anyway, I'd love for a chance to play with uh, code and 
have fun. Great, thank you. Last call. Anybody else? Great. With that, I'm going to invite uh, Clayton uh, to come up to introduce our speaker. Sure. Sure. All works. So, yeah, my name's Clayton. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Ann Arbor R user group. i got to make sure to stand where the camera is. And I know Ellis is also here, also co-organizer of the R user group. And so we're doing this joint meetup with PyData, which is really all Sean's work, and he's letting us take a little bit of credit for it, and so we really appreciate that. And I know I've seen a lot of R group faces here that I don't usually see here, so thank you all for showing up. And this month, we are very excited to have uh, Caitlin Hudon here from Austin, Texas. She's a lead data scientist at Online Med Ed, which is a learning platform for medical students. She's extremely involved in the, in the community, both locally and more broadly. She's a co-organizer of the Our Ladies Austin group. She gives talks all over, including most recently at South by Southwest and at the R Studio Conference uh, down in Austin earlier in January. She blogs at CaitlinHudon.com. And she tweets from uh, B on a posy. Hopefully she will show that at some point. I recommend you give her a follow. She talks a lot about some of the things that she'll be covering here during her experiences, like growing uh, a very new data science team and sort of figuring out what does data science look like at a, at a new, at a company that hasn't done it before. And I recently found myself in a very similar position. So now I'm following her on, on Twitter sort of even more carefully than I used to. She's got a lot of good stuff on there and it tends to be sort of a, uh, a rallying point for good opinions from the community because she'll say, you know, what do people like to do for this kind of tool or this kind of workflow? And and a lot of really smart people follow her, so you get all sorts of awesome responses to see like how do other people approach this thing that we all deal with. And so with that, I will pass it over to Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you, Clayton. Can you guys hear me okay? In the back? Yeah? Okay, cool. Awesome. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so Sean reached out to me last fall. Um, and it took, a, took us a little bit to get this thing scheduled. Um, now that I'm here, one of the things that was sort of holding us up is I was just starting a new job. So I started a new position at the end of September and he reached out about two weeks into that position and we were trying to figure out like what could I come talk about. And the thing I can come talk about is building data science in an org. So from the perspective of the first data science hire in an org, what does that even mean? What does that look like? What kind of decisions do you make? What does your day-to-day -day look like? And so this talk is just gonna be diving into that a little bit. Um, I did put a call out on Twitter actually to ask what kinds of things people were interested in and I got like five pages of responses. And so clearly this is a thing that people want to talk about. I'd love to talk to you folks afterwards or um, online if you have follow-up questions, but this talk is largely built around the questions that came out of those conversations. So, um, Clayton covered most of this. My position is lead data scientist at Online MedEd. Um, I'm really passionate about getting people into data science. Um, so I co-organize Our Ladies Austin and some other stuff in Austin. Um, I would call myself a data science generalist. Have you guys heard of like the generalist versus specialization thing that's conversation that's happening right now? Okay. Um, so an article came out recently in HBR um, and it was associated with Stitch Fix and it was talking about this idea of like a full stack generalist versus someone who specializes and when those things are helpful. Um, when you have a big team, it's really helpful to have people who specialize in certain parts of data science like NLP or a machine learning engineer or something like that. Um, I kind of come at it from the opposite direction. So I've done a lot of different data science-y things um, over the past eight years or so, and so I'm really a generalist. I'm comfortable working on all of the parts of the stack, but I'm not necessarily super experienced at every single part. Um, I think that's a good skill to have if you're going into startup data science, um, and I've recently made that transition. So. A couple other things, so um, that's the link to my blog, at Beyond Posey is where you can find me on Twitter and other things. And then um, hashtag building DS is a hashtag I created when I started this job to kind of track some of the things that I was doing. And so if you go back, you can see some real-time tweets of what I was thinking at certain times when I was making decisions and that sort of thing. Okay. So a little bit about Online MedEd, my employer. Um, so they are a startup. They've been around for about four years or so. Um, 
They are a medical platform um, that helps med students learn medicine better. So our mission is to make better doctors. And so um, they have hundreds of free videos and you can log in, you create an account, you can log in and watch those videos and they help you do better on some of your exams if you're a med student. Uh, we also, the way that we make money is we have add-ons. Um, we have subscriptions that you can pay for. So there are things like notes that you can buy and download. There's like a flash card thing that you can do. Um, we're launching a mobile app very, very soon. And so there's a ton of data and ways that we can generate data around our website. Um, and in fact, they had some data before they hired me. So when they decided they were at the point where they wanted to hire someone, um, they had some data already that they'd been collecting. They had data over time, but I wouldn't say that they necessarily had data about every part of the business that they wanted to understand. And so um, they had some things that they were interested in collecting but hadn't collected yet, but they also had piles of data that they'd collected, but just nobody had done anything with them. So they had data, they had business questions, they had ideas of things that they could do with the data, um, but they needed someone to step in and analyze it. One thing that's really cool about this company in particular is my boss, the CEO, is a trained epidemiologist. So he is an R guy, he understands R, he understands data, he gets the value of data science and that's been really helpful for getting buy-in and working on projects and all of that stuff. I'm happy to answer questions about the company specifically. So when I walked in for my first day, um, it's kind of a green field, right? I actually had done a little bit of consulting work for them, one project. So I had a little bit of a feel for what their data was like, but there was a lot of space where I could kind of decide what I wanted to do, what projects to work on. And that's a really nice thing as a data scientist. You can decide the projects you wanna work on, but it's also um, sort of scary because when you walk in, you don't know exactly like what is the first thing that you should be doing. Um, my directions from the CEO, he was about to go out on paternity leave right when I started. And so he gave me a list of projects that he thought would be helpful, things that he wanted to know. And then he also mentioned in that list, just add value. And so I like to think of this as part of why I'm at the company. And so I'm really there to do analysis, to do cool things, to add data to their projects, to help them become more data informed and make better data driven decisions. But I'm also like bottom line there to just add value. So when I see things that data could help improve or processes that I think we could work on, um, I have the flexibility to be able to kind of step in and, and help, which has been really useful. So I'm gonna talk a lot about data infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, um, I do mean all of the things here, but I have another slide to show you the other side of infrastructure that I mean. So when you walk into a company, um, they might have data collection mechanisms. That's how they're getting their data. How are they capturing it? Um, so for us, we were capturing whether people watched videos, for example, because you could mark that you'd watched a video. Um, we also were capturing individual things that you could do on the site because there were certain parts of the site that you had to be a paid user in order to access and so we have to gate access and so there's some data there which was great. Um, when you start working on problems you'll quickly discover what the data pipelines are if there are any data pipelines. So does the data go from the mechanism into a SQL database or something like that? Or is there a more complicated process that's moving data around or combining data from different sources? Um, you start to sort of see that right away. And then the databases and warehouses themselves, what do those look like? Um, are there many databases? Is there one database? Has it changed a lot over time? Are there core tables that you need to care about? Um, you'll discover that very quickly, as well as any tools that they have for doing exploratory data analysis, analysis in general, or machine learning tools. And so that would probably be if a company was a little bit more advanced. But I think this is all the stuff that we think of when we think of infrastructure, when we talk about data architecture. There's a lot more that goes into doing data science effectively and efficiently though. And so I, I'm calling that foundational infrastructure. Different people have different terms for it. Um, but one huge piece of that is documentation and knowledge capture. 
And so making sure that the data you're tracking, like the lineage, you're tracking any institutional knowledge that you gain around that data, this is actually a really nice project when you're first starting because you're learning a company's data while you're learning their business and their tech stack. I tend to take notes um, about anything that I'm learning, and so taking those notes and turning them into documentation is a logical next step, and it helps me as much as it helps the next person. Um, also, policies, politics, communication. So if you exist within an organization, you have to talk with other people, you have to communicate, and politics can become a part of that. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, it just means figuring out sort of how you're going to communicate with others. Also establishing policies around your data. So if there are certain ways that you wanna treat certain pieces of data, maybe there's some data that everyone should have access to, maybe there are some pieces of data that you don't necessarily wanna use for analysis, starting to establish those things on the team. Creating a plan to deliver on goals. So eventually you're going to create goals or things that you wanna do, and you need to have some sort of plan of how you're gonna get from raw data to deliverables for the company, whatever those deliverables might be. So infrastructure isn't just coming in and looking at the pipeline or the um, SQL database and doing things from there. It's a lot more um, packaging around it. And then also, as you start to build a team, thinking really carefully about the structure and the roles on that team, so different teams um, look differently depending on both the size of the org that you're at as well as the function of the team. So in some companies, data is really the core product. Those teams tend to look very different than if you're working at something like a startup where they're starting to add data or access the data that they have and do analysis around it. So a little bit about what my first week looked like. This is not very data science-y, but I think it's useful just to get everyone on the same page. Like, the first week looks like the same week at a lot of other jobs. Um, so learning the business model is really important. If you've seen the data science Venn diagram, um, knowing the business is a big piece of that. Um, getting access to all of the things that you need access to database, that takes time, that takes communication. Talking to different stakeholders. Um, so my boss had me meet with the two lead engineers in my first week to kind of talk about where things were, if they had plans that might um, work with the data, we wanted to know that. Um, starting to learn the data itself and its lineage. So I started to dive into the databases a little bit, just a little bit of like select star from, limit five, what does this data even look like? What does it tie to? Are there things I can tie together? Um, and starting to get the stories, like the oral history of some of the data. So when I came in, my boss said, you know, I'd love to hand you a map, but start up. And so I really learned that, you know, sometimes as much as people would like to document things and would like to have this perfect documentation, you know, time gets in the way. And so um, getting comfortable with that and talking and starting to write things down is a way to add value very quickly. Another thing that I ran into was a little bit more cultural. So I was the first data scientist that anyone in my company had worked with. And that was a really new position for me as well. Um, I've done data science for a number of years in a number of different orgs, but usually there was someone who was sort of familiar with data science. Um, my CEO was familiar with data science because he sort of came from that world, like um, epidemiology, statistics, he got it. So I spent a lot of time my first week just kind of explaining the things that I did. And some of the questions I got were really basic, even things like, do you use Git? And so we really had to do a little bit of education around um, the types of things that we were doing with our data currently, the types of things that we wanted to do with the data, what the roadmap was, and just talking to people and getting them on the same page with what my role was, what my tech stack was. Um, it was interesting. I got to know all of the people who um, spoke Python very quickly. Um, so yeah. Another thing that's really important, I think, when you're starting any new job, um, but particularly if you're building something, if you're building towards something. Um, I read this book, The First 90 Days, based on a recommendation on Twitter. And so your early wins have to be kind of double wins. Like you wanna be delivering value as soon as you can for the company, but you also wanna be laying out the infrastructure and building things out so that things are better in the long run. 
And so that was something that I kept in my head a lot when I was working on some of the early analyses. So I'd spend part of my time doing analysis and then part of my time building towards the future. Um, that's a really tricky balance. I would love to hear other people talk about how they've done that. Um, but yeah, just being cognizant of the fact that you want to be delivering things while you're setting up for the long term. Have you guys ever seen the data science hierarchy of needs? Is this familiar to some of you? OK, cool. Um, I love this. This has been so useful for explaining in my org what it is that I do and why I care so much about collecting data and having good data and vetting it. Um, so at the very top of the pyramid, we have AI and deep learning. That's the stuff that they've all heard about. Um, right below that, A-B testing, simple ML, that kind of stuff. That's stuff that we can get to pretty easily. And even if you walk into a startup that has some data, you might be able to get there fairly quickly. But I think it's really important that the collect, move, store, and explore, transform all come at the bottom of the pyramid. Like you really need to have good data, good data collection in order to do all of the cool stuff at the top of the pyramid. And so my first six months really have been focused on the bottom of the pyramid, making sure that we have data, we have good data, it's going to the right places, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, giving this as a visual for folks to understand has been really helpful um, as I'm trying to like build a case for building some of this stuff. So in the first few weeks, um, I built some core tooling. And I have this, it's a no-brainer thing over here because these are the things I would do if I were to walk onto any team. Um, these aren't decisions that I had to make that were specific to being the first data scientist or working at a startup. These are just things that I would do if they didn't exist in any org. So this is general advice. Um, one is stack tools. I'll show you in the next slide what I mean by that. But getting things set up with like a Git repository, um, setting up a Slack channel, just setting up all the things that your team needs to communicate and share work. Um, also building a data dictionary, um, so a shared language of what your data means. And we'll cover all of this a little bit more in depth. Um, a query library, so tracking all of your queries in Git. If you're querying something often, it's probably very important. It's probably something you want to track. And then creating some sandbox sandboxes to connect to the data and start playing with the data, analyzing the data, and a little bit of um, templates for building out projects. So stack tools, um, some things I added in the first few weeks. Um, this is Confluence. So um, we use the Atlassian stack. That's something I didn't make a decision about. Um, it's a really common stack, um, but that Confluence is like a place where you can gather knowledge. And so it's kind of like wiki um, documents. So we have our data science space, and we have some pages and stuff that I've added there. Um, we added a JIRA board. And so we, we could talk, we could do a whole separate talk about running agile on data science and whether that's a good idea or not a good idea. Um, I have some opinions, but I'm still tracking the work that I'm doing in tickets. So um, we created a JIRA board so that we could start tracking the work. Um, a data science channel on our Slack, internal um, Slack group channel. And so uh, this was partially so that we could answer questions from other people in the org, and then partially so that I could disseminate any of the things that I've done. And then finally, um, we use Bitbucket instead of GitHub, but um, repositories. So creating places where we could put and store our code and give everyone access. So these are just kind of the basic tools um, that I think you would need to set up a team. I'm sure there are more things that you could add to this list, but this is what I did um, in the first few days, first week um, that I was on. The next thing that I worked on is um, building a data dictionary. So as I was talking with people from different teams about the types of data that they had, what data um, pain points there were, if there were fields or tables that they were using over and over again, I was recording all of that. Um, I think that's really important. It's really helpful for yourself. So you're setting yourself up to answer questions in the future. Um, but also for the next person. So the next person who started working with the data, I gave her a data dictionary. And so she has the things that I have explored, my knowledge of those things. 
Um, I have worked at places where the history of the data is entirely oral. That's a really bad thing. That's not a thing that you want to start with. And so I think um, when you're learning is the best time to really be building these things. The other thing that's kind of cool about a data dictionary is like, it tracks my knowledge of the data as I'm building it. And we'll see the same thing with a query repository, but you can see me learning the databases and the data better by like the updates in the um, data dictionary and query libraries, which is kind of cool because your analysis is only as good as your knowledge of the data and that really is going to inform the conclusions that you make. So um, when I say a query repository or, oh, you have a question? Yeah, so nothing that was built to make data dictionaries. Um, mine's just in Google Sheets. And so we have a shared Google Sheet and we have the link and then we put the link on our Confluence. Um, eventually, it should have a better home. But for now, start up and we're still building it. So yeah, good question. Um, and also different people have different opinions on that. This is actually, that's a question I asked on Twitter and I got a lot of really interesting uh, varied responses. Um, that would be a good thread for me to probably go dig up, but if you search for it, I'm sure you could find it. People have strong opinions on the tools that you should use to do that and where it should live. Some people think it should live um, within your like SQL queries or within your code. Um, I opted to keep it separately and that's just worked for me on other teams, but you, you could really go either way. Yeah, those are small decisions to make depending on the org. Um, so the query library is just the idea of taking your SQL, um, putting it in a place where other people can see it, and then tracking it with Git. So if you're changing your SQL over time, um, for me, for example, I'm finding out more about our user base. A lot of this stuff that involves is like filters. Like as you figure out like, oh, this field, made sense at this time, but then this thing happened in our software and it changed, and so maybe don't use it after this time. If you start to look at someone's SQL queries over time, you'll see that sort of change. And this is really nice because you can document like why you're making those changes and what the knowledge was that caused you to update those queries. And you're always going to need that query again. That's my other thing. Um, whenever I do like a one-off project, someone always asks for a different version of it or an update of it. And so it's really nice to just save the SQL one place and have access to it. Um, another thing that I've done is um, sandbox projects with notebooks. How many of you have ever heard of Project Template before? It's an R package or cookie cutter for Python? Okay, yeah. So it's the idea of um, creating a template for your projects and it just makes your life a lot easier. You don't have to think about the architecture, the scaffolding. You just kind of copy this pre-existing thing and then you start to fill it in with like your notebook and your data and all that good stuff. Um, so this is the outline that comes with project template. I didn't actually use that this time around. I learned by using project template. I've edited it a little bit, um, but I think they're a good starting point. And then the other thing is like a sandbox notebook. And so I couldn't actually paste our notebooks here, but I kind of pasted the idea of what they do. Importing a bunch of commonly used packages, connecting to the database, I put like a sample query in there, and then um, taking that query and turning it into a data frame. And so that's just a really nice thing because then I can edit it and I get started and I just don't think about the scaffolding. Anything that saves me time and that I'm doing over and over again, I try to automate. And earlier the better. Um, so that was the first week, two weeks or so. Um, so the first six months, really, like what I've been doing up until now, a lot of it has been tooling decisions and making decisions about the business. Um, in this talk, I'm not really going into much on the analysis that I was doing, um, but I was balancing this the whole time with delivering analyses and answering business questions. So that's kind of the piece that's missing from this picture. Um, so one of the questions that we had was like, how can we help with business intelligence? Um, we wanted to make some BI sort of decisions. And by BI, I mean in this case, I guess like data that was looking backwards at what happened. And so we have stakeholders who want to be able to answer really 
basic questions, things like how many people used our software in the last month. Um, and we didn't have anyone doing that. And so I built some really basic reporting and stuff um, to do that. Are we collecting enough data? So we knew that there were holes in our um, customer acquisition flow, in our usage that we wanted to try to plug. And so we had to figure out the best way to collect more data. Um, sharing our analyses. So originally, when I started doing analyses, I would um, put them in a report. And then I put that report on Confluence because that's where we wanted everything to live in one like central location. But pretty quickly, I realized that's not reproducible. That's not best practice. Um, I was going in and just updating the numbers on the report like once a month. And so we decided that we needed a tool to be able to share these things and to be able to um, help other people like run them live. That would be helpful. And so we started looking into different ways that we could share analysis. Um, a lot of these are problems that I've encountered at other companies, but usually at the point at which someone has figured it out. And so the thing that was most interesting to me is like the decision making process around this. Like, I know I need reproducible reporting, but what do I actually do to get there? Um, helping other departments. So we know there are departments who are not data driven, who haven't seen the data that goes along with their work. And so we wanted to be able to provide that data and help them make good decisions. Um, shaping data pipelines. So I think this is actually a good project to do at um, a time where you've been working with the data a little bit, not right off the bat, um, because you know the data better. You start to know some of the quirks, you start to know some of the things that you might look out for. And so I've recently started thinking about data pipelines and what those should look like. And then what other resources do we need? So as we're going along, we're realizing there's other resources that we need. What are those things? How do we get them? So we'll walk through some of these decisions. Um, this first one was around powering business intelligence. I don't know if you've all seen this before. Um, it's a tool called ChartMogul. And so one of the things I had to do as the first data person in the org was connect the data to all of these different apps and things that would help the business. So this is a BI tool. This cohort analysis is actually kind of cool. It looks into um, the way that people churn over time. But um, powering this thing actually took some time and some thought. So we have changed our billing system um, twice. And so those migrations mean that we have data that lives in different formats, in different systems, from different times. And so that's something that I had to think about. How do we combine those things? And actually, we have an engineer who does a lot of um, customer support stuff. And so she had a really good understanding of the data and the billing systems in particular. And so she was particularly well suited to help with this project and connecting accounts across systems and that sort of thing. Um, that's not a really. That's an example of something that's um, not super exciting. It's not an exciting or new problem to solve, but it's the kind of thing that needs to get solved, and preferably the earlier the better, so that those things aren't pain points later on down the road. Another thing we had to focus on was data collection. And so um, my friend is an analytics architect. I didn't know that there was a term for that role. Um, but what she does is, worry about um, eventing data and figuring out what that data should look like and how it should interact with different systems. And so I've spent probably four months working on our data architecture and our data collection. That's really like that's the bottom part of the pyramid. It's super foundational, super important. And so um, we settled on a tool called Segment. That decision was made before I came on board, um, but it's been good so far. And we use that in order to collect data on our website. So for example, if you do a search, um, we weren't capturing like what folks were searching for. Uh, there's business value in that. We could start to do predictive things around search. We could start to upsell and cross sell. There's all kinds of good business things we could do there. Um, so one of the things that we had to do was come up with the kinds of events that we would want to track, how exactly we would want to track them, where we want that data to live, how does that data combine, and someone has to be sort of in charge of all of that. And so that's been a huge part of my role, is um, personally coming up with like over 200 events that we're now tracking on our website, and then working with our devs to implement the tech that we need in order to track those things, 
QAing that data, which is super important. So the things that I'm asking for from our devs are not always exactly the things that I get back. Things get lost in translation and communication. And so it's not just coming up with the plan, it's also working through the data and making sure that it's actually the thing that we think it is and that it's doing the things that we think it is. Um, the other kind of cool thing about Segment is that we use it to power some of our other data outputs. Um, so we've collected that in Amazon Redshift. Um, it feeds Google Analytics. We're able to connect it with HubSpot, which is a marketing tool. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we're able to connect that with Mode Analytics, which we're using um, to do analytics and dashboarding. So um, sharing analyses internally, this is where we're using a tool called Mode Analytics. There's all kinds of stuff that you can use to do this. Um, you can also choose to like spin up your own way of sharing reports. So this decision took a lot of input from outside sources. Um, I talked to friends, I asked questions on Twitter, and eventually we decided to give this a try, um, partially because of our particular needs. So our data lives in multiple databases, and it was surprisingly hard to find a tool that lets you combine data from multiple databases and then let business users kind of access that data. Um, that's one of those pain points that's very particular to our organization, but when you start looking at tools, those are the kinds of things that you have to think through. Um, so we're able to share analyses internally here, and it allows you to build um, like Python notebooks and R notebooks so you can do an actual analysis. It's not just like select star from and then bubble up that report, which has been really nice. Um, another thing that we've done is enabled marketing with data. And so this is HubSpot. Um, those modalities are things that people can do on our website. Like you could download a whiteboard. It's like an image of after a lecture, all of the notes on a whiteboard. Um, those are things that we're collecting with segment. And so those are things we had to specifically decide that we wanted to collect, decide that we want to analyze down the line, invest in that value, um, and then pull that in. As the only data person, making sure that the right data goes to the right person in the right way, that has fallen to me. And so this is an example of the kind of project that I'm doing if I'm helping to enable other stakeholders. And it's all the sort of foundational work that'll let us get even more data and have even more things that we can start to analyze, which is really exciting. Um, shaping data pipelines. So focusing on pain points, we figured out that in order to see purchases at a certain time, we have to query and go through, kind of snake through something like eight different SQL tables. Um, those things just weren't designed by a data scientist or someone with the end data or the end use of data science in mind. And so having someone like me go back through them and kind of figure out like, okay, where could we pull this data? How could we pull this data together in a better way in our own pipeline where we could build our own sort of curated version of the truth that makes sense for doing analysis? Um, raw data is artifacts. It doesn't necessarily represent the truth. It represents the truth at the time at which you pulled it and in the way in which you pulled it. And so sometimes you have to kind of navigate what that truth might be and pull the data into a different format to make it work for you or to make it work for the team. Um, the third piece is automating where it makes sense. So as I've been finding pain points like, oh, hey, I pull the same query once a week at least, that tells me that that should be its own view or its own table. I should be doing that roll up once so that I don't have to keep doing it. So the analyses that you're doing can start to inform the architecture and the data engineering decisions that you make. Um, another really important part is knowledge documentation. So these are actual um, tables that we have in our confluence that help to explain different parts of the business. And it's mostly the stuff that you like have to go look up. You're like, oh, what was that code again? What did that mean? Or what was this group of people? And so I would advocate for um, taking anything that you constantly have to look up or try to keep in your head and just writing that down, putting it in a central location, letting everyone see it and edit it and touch it. And then you get the shared benefit of the knowledge across the institution. So for example, 
we have different subscription codes, um, so we created this thing that explains all of the different subscriptions and, and what they mean from a business perspective. Um, another thing that's been really useful here and at other companies is like a calendar of notable events. So sometimes you'll be looking at data over time and you'll see like a weird spike or a weird dip or something that's unexpected. And when you talk to a business stakeholder, you might develop a whole analysis and then talk to a business stakeholder and they'll know something like, oh yeah, that's when we switched billing systems or that's when we launched that new product or that's when so-and-so started working on this other stack. And so those kinds of things are so helpful to know in hindsight when you're looking at the data, but they're not the kinds of things that people think to write down, especially if they don't come from a data background. So we've created a calendar of those kinds of events and you can see some of the questions that we're answering. And then also um, promotion codes overview. So we have like promotions that we offer in our store. If we're doing cohort analysis, some of the people who buy on a promotion might look different than customers who don't buy on a promotion. And so knowing that data and understanding it, having, sum having it summarized in an easy way just makes us get from raw data to insight that much faster. So um, the data science hierarchy of needs, if we come back here, um, this is really where I've spent my first six months. So a lot of collecting the data, a lot of moving it around a little bit, figuring out storage, figuring out what our events should look like, and designing that stuff. This is all stuff that is investment, right? So we're spending a little bit of time now in hopes that it will pay off in the long run. Having a really solid data infrastructure um, is something that we'll be able to optimize both for our team as well as um, to leverage on other teams. So as we're finding pain points and creating new resources to tackle them, we're creating things that are useful for other people. Um, a good example of that is like switching billing systems um, in order to find all of the people who have ever made a purchase, for example, that means that you have to go to different billing systems. And so one of the things that we've created recently is just a single table with all of that information. Sounds so simple, but if you don't have that, you're constantly just redoing this work and rethinking through things, and it's just uh, clogging up the amount of time that it takes to get from data to actual insight. So the next six months um, will be spent just a little bit further up the pyramid. So the collect stage is nearly done. Um, moving in storage is kind of the next thing that I'm gonna be really working on alongside some analysis. So we're actually gonna to get to some cool um, analysis in the next six months that I'm really excited about. So this role has been a little bit different than like a traditional data scientist role because you're making some of these decisions that are foundational and you're setting up both yourselves and other people to be able to use the data in a way that's effective. Um, that's been really cool and interesting for me, especially as someone who has opinions about this stuff, having seen some of um, the way that people work with data been cluttered by poor ecosystems. Um, this is a problem I've been really excited to work on, but I feel like it's really important to be honest that if you get hired as the first data scientist in a company, you're not starting out doing AI unless someone has curated a really beautiful path to get there for you. Um, so sometimes I sort of feel like I'm the person riding out in front of the army to see what everything looks like and sort of come up with a plan and have an idea before we actually get people and invest time and resources into all of that stuff. Um, so some upcoming projects for me, um, building stronger data pipelines. So an engineer once told me that uh, startups run on cron jobs and duct tape. <laughs> and I love that. Um, it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around the idea of that being okay, because I came from larger companies where that's not something that they would encourage. Um, but yeah, for now we're crown jobs and duct tape and we'll get to a point where we'll need to have something that's a little bit less brittle. And so I'm excited to work on that a little bit alongside the analysis. Um, also enabling stakeholders with data. So we have a ton of different ways, like all of this new data that we've been collecting with that tool segment, those 200 plus events, 
that's data that's never been seen in our company before. There's all kinds of value there that's completely untapped. So I'm really excited to share that and do more analysis on all of this stuff. Um, I got a few questions about like first data science projects and what to pick. In my case, my CEO understands data. He had some questions that he knew were the types of questions that I could answer. But I think general advice is like to talk to stakeholders, figure out what's working and what's not, and if there are pain points, if there are things that they kind of wish they could see, and where data could be the most helpful. Um, I've actually been having those conversations last week, this week, and next week. And so these are the questions that I'm asking my stakeholders. So if you want to steal these, you completely can. Um, but I'm asking basically, like, what data do you wish you had? Like in a dream world, what would you be collecting? And the sooner I know these things, the sooner we can set up for them. So even if we're not collecting it now, in six months, we might have enough data to make some really cool decisions and do some interesting analysis. Um, what data do you use currently and where does it live? I'm just interested in this from a data perspective. So if folks are grabbing data from a source that you didn't know about or maybe a source that isn't as up to date as another source, it's really helpful to have an idea of how data flows around your organization. And I don't mean in pipelines, I mean like where do people go when they have these kinds of questions. And then my last question for the stakeholders is like, do you have any questions about data at online med ed? And um, that's been really interesting. There are people who have had like, legitimate questions about things that we're tracking, or where do things live, or how do I access? And so it's been nice to get some of those pain points out of the way so that we can help like, democratize our data and, and get more and be able to provide more. Um, the other thing, so like build versus buy and vendor decisions is something that I've been asked about. I think this is really tough. It's really org by org and decision by decision. Um, but this is the way that I think through it. So I think the most important thing you can do is develop a really thorough understanding of the pain points of your organization and how you might fix them. Um, then go ahead and survey the landscape, see what kinds of solutions are out there. Um, Talk to your developers, too, if you're thinking about building something in-house. Like, what would that look like? What's the effort? I've been surprised sometimes at how easy or hard things would be to track if we're interested in tracking them build versus buy. Um, so talking to people has been really helpful. And then asking for advice. Um, so I specifically ask the community when I have questions. Um, but just asking for advice generally has been really good. And then weighing out the pros and cons of short-term versus long-term solutions. So you might notice that we didn't go with Tableau as our BI tool. Um, I've worked in organizations where Tableau has been really great. It's been really helpful. We don't need all of those bells and whistles right now. It's just not where we are. And so just being realistic about the pros and cons and short-term, long-term, where are you now? Where do you want to grow? It's been helpful. Question? <laughs> yeah, it should be. Yeah, exactly. Did totally. Find that you need to consider yes, of course. Um, budget's a big consideration. So, like for us, you know, we're a startup. We have to make um, tough decisions, and we have to run in a way that's a little bit um, agile and a little bit like edge of the map. And so that can be a really cool thing. It can empower you to look at new tools or solutions that other people haven't tried. But it also can mean sometimes that things can be cost prohibitive, some of the um, common tools. Um, and then finally, make a decision. And you can always go back if your decision doesn't work out, you know, um, but just getting something in place. And then um, another question I've been asked a lot about is being the only person it, who is doing the thing that you're doing in an org and like what do you do and the thing that I do the most is lean on community so um, the community has been really helpful for answering questions that I have um, I shared this slide because when I was trying to figure out like okay how do other people distribute or host reports and dashboards like I have some ideas I've done it in other companies but like maybe there's something out there I'm totally not considering and you can see I got 51 responses. <laughs> so people are really interested in sharing their knowledge and sharing the things that they've learned. 
And taking some of that advice to heart can be really helpful. Um, it can also keep you engaged with other people. So it's nice to have an idea of what other people are doing and then you can take those best practices in-house as well as have a sounding board so you don't feel lonely or like you're really the only person doing this stuff. Um, there are lots of people who are the only data scientist or the first data scientist or a new data scientist or a very experienced data scientist, wherever you might be. <laughs> Thanks. We have time for some questions. Yeah. Um, how might your advice or your opinions differ in giving to data people that are in a large organization? Is there anything about what you're saying that's different for? Can you repeat the question. Yeah, repeat the question. Sure. So um, how would my advice change for someone at a large organization? So I think if you're at a large organization and you're making your first data hire and there's truly been no one focusing on the data, you're going to run into a lot of the same problems that a startup or a small organization would. And in my experience, large organizations are made up of smaller organizations. So even when I've been in a large org, the databases that we're using might be specific to um, a group or a smaller part of the org. And so I think a lot of this will translate. Some of the budget stuff won't necessarily. Um, I'm really lucky in that I, I can make decisions. You know, I have, I've been empowered to make decisions. And of course, like I, I talk them over with other people. Um, but I've found that in larger organizations, sometimes there's just more parts of the ladder or the chain that you have to work with. And so there can be a little bit more um, political maneuvering that you need to do or sort of justifying things. And that can take time and you might make some decisions a little bit differently. You might not pick the most cutting edge tool if you have to prove to your boss that it's absolutely going to work and going to solve all of your problems. Yeah. So how big is Meta? And the second part of the question is what would trigger uh, the hire of a person like you? Sure. When I first started. Yeah, so um, online med ed, I believe, is around 40 people right now. We've done some hiring lately, so it'll settle somewhere around there. Um, and then uh, what would trigger the hire of someone like me? I think when you start to have data and you start to have business questions, you start thinking about like, okay, I don't have time to analyze this. Who can analyze these things? And if you find that there's no one in your org who has the time or the capacity to answer the questions that you have, then it might be time to bring someone on. Um, another thing I didn't really cover here, but it's also really interesting to have a data scientist work in the architecture of the data collection. Um, that's not a thing I've always gotten to be a part of. It's been really cool from my perspective because I've worked usually at the other end of that river. Like I, the data's already been collected and flowing, um, but to get to have some say about that has been really interesting. And so it, it's worth considering what kind of person you might bring into that role. A data engineer might make sense for some folks, um, but a data scientist or someone with an analysis background, I think can bring a really interesting viewpoint to that conversation. Questions? Are we out in the back? In the back? Okay. So the question is, um, I came to online med ed, a startup as um, someone who had experience in data science and would it be easy for someone um, who doesn't have as much experience to, to work in a startup or as the first data science hire. I would not advise if you are coming, if it's your first job, to be the first data science person. Um, I like to learn from other people. I think it's really helpful to see things done right and even sometimes to see things done not so right in order to build up some of the intuitions, in order to make decisions that'll have long-ranging effect. Um, that said, I think becoming a generalist is a really useful skill, knowing just something about each part of the process 
makes you communicate better with people in a larger org. And so I would definitely encourage people to go work at a startup. I just wouldn't encourage you to be the first hire. So you had the, the graph of the uh, hierarchy of needs, and you made the comment that um, if you're the first hire, you come to a board that doesn't yet have those machines in practice, you're not going to do an AI. Uh, how do you convince the operators and people above you that the ROI on hiring you was worth it in the long term benefits? It could, it could take six months to a year to get that to get to the process. How do you convince that you slow down? Um, yeah, I think being upfront with that idea when you're in the interview process. Um, I read a really good article and it was called like how not to hire your first data scientist. And it was about this really terrible situation that can happen where like you expect great things from this person. They come in and they're like, there's no pipeline. And so they're like, okay, I need devs to build a pipeline. And then folks are building a pipeline for you and you're not doing anything with the data and that leads to frustration and it's, it's just a really tough situation. I think communication would be the best way to kind of cut through that, but that's a that's a tough situation. Um, and it's also about like managing expectations. Um, I'm really lucky like my CEO understands data, understands that this stuff takes time. Um, but I, I could see marketing, marketing makes things a little bit tough, right? It makes it seem like it's really easy to walk in and do that stuff and that's just not always the case. Anybody else? Yeah, sure. Maybe the, the last question is here and then on the side. Okay. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'm the only data scientist in my current position. Okay. I came from a place where there's like a thousand. So it's <laughs> really difficult. Um, I guess my question would be, what is your biggest frustration, I guess, that you didn't realize coming into a startup having had that experience at a larger enterprise and just has been eye-opening? Sure. Um, my biggest frustration is just how long things take. Um, I want... I want to be done collecting data. Like I want to have that and I want to build um, pipelines and I want to do all of this cool stuff. And it's just, everything takes longer than expected. It's like if you're sizing tasks for like Agile or Jira, um, you're always supposed to add, you know, a certain amount of time. Um, so I think my biggest frustrations are with timeline and just getting things done. Um, yeah. Last question. Early on in your career, uh, what made you passionate about data science? And like, what was your very first data science project that you worked on like, that might interest you in pursuing this career? Sure. Um, so I went to school for statistics, and I double majored in statistics and English. And my plan was to go actuarial, um, so to do sort of data science-y things in the insurance industry. Um, while I was studying for actuarial exams, there was a company uh, nearby that was hiring and it was a predictive analytics company. And so that sounded really interesting to me. Predictive analytics was my favorite part of learning stats, not necessarily something I thought was a job that you could do full time. And so I interviewed with the company, they hired me and I was absolutely hooked on predicting things. And so um, my first job there, I stayed there for about four years. Um, and that involved some consulting work, it involved working with really messy data, nonprofit data, if anyone's ever gotten into that. Um, so it was, it was really good. But my first projects were um, building models for nonprofits. Yeah. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Caitlin again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, sure. But, uh, but also specifically, uh, not only for sharing her journey, but also for, for myself, right? For uh, being an example, especially in terms of soliciting advice from the data science community because it is a new thing, right? And uh, I think it, you're setting a wonderful example for all of us here of how to approach that. So let's thank Caitlin okay. again for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.